Well, over the past weekend, who's tired, by the way? <laughs> oh, it's been great, but I tell you, I'm barely standing up right now. <laughs> we've been looking at 2 Chronicles 7, 14. And we've been looking at what God is looking for in us. Because revival doesn't start in a meeting. Revival doesn't start in the world. Revival is a work that begins in us. When we start to carry the fire of God to the world around us. And we've asked, what is God looking for in his people? What does a revived Christian look like? We've covered the need for humility, for an active and powerful prayer life. We've looked at seeking God's face and his blessing and the urgent need for repentance. And when we as believers start to get this stuff, when we start to live this stuff that we've talked about over the weekend, in itself that is revival. Because revival, when we start living like that, happens in us. We live a revived life. That fire kindles itself again. And that's when we start to change the world. When the church gets it right, people get saved. When we are a zealous people, zealous for good works, people start to get saved. Titus 2, verses 13 to 14. Oops. Can you put up Titus 2 for me? Thank you very much. Waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people of his own possession who are zealous for good works. Do you want to be zealous for good works? The promise of 2 Chronicles 7, 14 is that prayer will be answered. God will forgive and God will no longer be withholding his blessing. And that which has been damaged will be healed. In context, in 2 Chronicles, what was damaged at the time was the literal land. It was by locust and by plague and by all kinds of other adverse events, which were part of the curse should Israel not obey. When the people of God move away from God, the land suffers as a result. Now, that was to Israel at a certain time. Does that apply today? Well, I think we can see today, without looking very hard, that a weak church leads to a corrupt and damaged land. Because a weak church does not speak into society. And when the church stops speaking, society loses track. Society starts to move away from God. It's cause and effect. It was true before Wesley. And it's true today. And God promised Israel that if they would repent, he would restore the land to productivity and newness. And in a similar vein, in New Testament times, we can expect God to help regain the church's fruitfulness. We can expect God to help the church regain its holiness. See, God's all about healing. God's all about taking what's been devastated and ravaged by sin and making it right. And when the church is revived, the land can be healed because the church is speaking into it again. The church is taking a stand again. The church has stopped backing down. Where sin does its dirty work, where relationships, hearts and minds have been damaged and corrupted, God can bring a renewing work. 
Where the church has become an ugly spectacle in society because of hypocrisy and liberalism, it can instead be a beacon of hope and light and truth. Duncan Campbell, who was part of the Hebridean revival, said this. A baptism of holiness, a demonstration of godly living, is the crying need of our day. I'd say that's as true today as it was when Duncan Campbell said it. We need a baptism of holiness. We need a demonstration of godly living in the church. Yes, there's hypocrites in the church. I'm a hypocrite in the church, but that's not okay. I want to be holy. I want to live a good life. I want to live a life that the world can see and see that there's something different about me. That's the cry in need because unless we look different, unless we are different to the world, why should people bother paying any attention? If the church gets holy living right, godly living, godly community right, then we're really meeting the needs of the society that we're in. As Ephesians 5 verses 26 and 27 said regarding Christ and his church, it says this, that he might sanctify her having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he himself, sorry, that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Now this is talking, of course, about when Christ comes, and we know he will sanctify us completely when he comes, And takes us to be with him. Yet the goal, and part of what we, you know, been taught to pray, is that His will is done on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, even though this is something that's still to come, why should we be waiting for that day to come before we're made without blemish? Why should not our goal be? Let's be without blemish. Why shouldn't we be aiming to be spotless before God? We should pray for God to do a cleansing and sanctifying work in his church that the world has yet to see. We should long to be mirror images of the purity of Christ himself. Now I understand. I nearly drank the microphone. (laughs) I understand that perfection, this side of eternity, is unobtainable. But there should remain in our hearts a relentless desire for it. A relentless desire to be the beautiful, spotless bride of Christ. I look in the mirror and I know I don't see somebody who's beautiful and spotless. You know what I mean. (laughs) But I can long to be. Yet perhaps we don't want it. Because if others see Christ in us, there's something that will happen. We will be persecuted. 2 Timothy 3.12 says, I'm struggling with this today. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. It's interesting, it doesn't say all those who live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. All those who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. See, it's not about attaining. It's about desiring. Otherwise, we get into a performance type of Christianity. It's not about attaining. It's about desiring. We need to understand something about persecution. Persecution is not... God testing you. In fact, persecution shouldn't be a surprise. Persecution does not mean you're getting something wrong or that God is preparing you for something bigger. Persecution is our natural state of being. Persecution is how our lives actually should be. Jesus kept warning about it. The question isn't, are you going to be persecuted? 
Because we've already got the answer to that question. Yes. The question at hand is whether or not you will desire to live a godly life before our Lord. And if only the church would live as people who have been revived, I tell you society would be impacted by that. Culture might not change, but culture will be confronted. And the church can show the world what a godly culture really looks like. But we've got to model it. Yeah. Well, you know when you watch the news now? Or you watch it. Everything's a story. Everything's a story. Everything's got this narrative to it. And the trouble is, you look at all the things that are going on now. You look at the arguments that are winning the day. You look at the pride movement, for example. They're telling a story that people have hooked into. They're telling a narrative that people have got alongside. All we need to do is tell our story because it's a better story. We need to get the story across of what a godly culture really is. Because we've got the better story. A godly culture. Looks like the early church. The world's culture will always be different from the church's culture. But we need to see the example of the culture we ought to be. Acts 2 verses 42 to 47. We have an example of the early church here. And it says this about them. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and prayers. I might abandon this. It's not working out. Hold on. There we go. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. I'm going to work. Can you just put the... the um... <coughs> Is that okay? That's not working out for me. I'm just, I'll, I'll just skip through this. Hold on. And get to something blank. Ah, oh, dear me. <sighs> Come on. Come on. Come on. No. Can you just put up a black, like the, the logo? Just, just, yeah, that'll do. Thank you. Right. No, nothing more behind me. Let's read Acts 2, verse 42 to 47. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number, day by day, those who were being saved. This is a true community. It's not forced, it's not fake, and it's not for sure. And there's a couple of things we can learn from this early church. Number one, the early church was devoted to learning God's word. There was an enthusiasm to continually take in as much teaching about God's word as possible. In our day, we get angry if the message goes on more than 40 minutes. We've got a chicken in the oven. The early Christians were devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching continually. They just took in as much as they could get. Now, that's not to say they stopped working and just went to church all day, every day. But rather, in so much as they were able, they took advantage of every opportunity to hear the word preached and to learn. I wonder, do we take every opportunity to get in the word? Or does EastEnders get in the way? <coughs> Do people still watch EastEnders? Okay. Does Coronation Street get in? Does people? No. Just, there we go. <laughs> Does Facebook get in the way? 
Do we have that same desire? To get in the Word whenever we can. See, this wasn't forced upon them. This wasn't like a legalistic expectation. And there's a danger of that. It was that their love for God and their desire to know Him more was so powerful that they couldn't help themselves from discussing God's Word. They'd meet up and discuss God's Word. When's the last time we met up in Costa and discussed God's Word? I'm not looking at you, Steve. You do that all the time. <laughs> Where's this desire to get together and talk about things that matter instead of things that don't matter? I'm completely lost. It was this desire they had in. They were sharing what they were learning with others. They were seeking wisdom from people who were being led of God. And you know, too often in modern Christianity, we just don't want to learn more. Because we think we've learned enough. Learning's hard. Learning requires effort, attention, concentration. And very often, it means we need to change something about ourselves when we learn there's something wrong. And we kind of don't want to do that. Theology is the study of God. And God is not boring. God is the ultimate in relevance. If a sermon makes God boring, or if as a people we've developed is to only hear what we want to hear, then that's a problem. It's not God at fault, it's the person preaching. If you're bored, sorry, it's my fault, not God's. I hope you're not. <laughs> we need the word of God. We need each and every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. We need it from beginning to end. We need it like we need food. No. We need it like we need water. No. We need it like we need oxygen. Bear Grylls. Who watches Bear Grylls' as island? Not the island? When people go on there, he gives them some advice. He has what he calls the rule of three. You can't survive for three weeks without food. Three days without water. And three minutes without oxygen. He also says three seconds for a bad decision. If you treat the word of God like it's food... You know you need it. But you know what? You can get by with a little bit sometimes. And after a while, you can keep on going. And you can live without it. You'll get hungry after a while. But then you can get that desire sorted. And you can move on. If you treat it like it's water, then after a few days, you'll be thirsty. You'll be wanting it. If you treat the word of God like oxygen... And then every hour, every part of your day, it's vital. And you can't survive without it. May God give us hearts to believe the entirety of Scripture and seek to learn it cover to cover. The second thing we can learn from this early church is the early church experienced authentic community. The early church were devoted themselves to fellowship with one another and with the apostles. Hadn't it been nice this weekend hanging out with each other? <laughs> has, has it been nice this weekend <laughs> hanging out with each other? <laughs> they needed this interaction with the apostles and with each other. They could see what was modeled in the apostles and what the apostles were teaching. See, the early church understood the apostles had been with Christ and were called by God to be their shepherds and their teachers. So they were willing and eager to learn from these guys. And it was for good reason. You know, the apostles' ministry was more about just locking themselves in a room and studying and Bible reading, only appearing once a week. They did devote themselves to prayer and study, but they were part of the community, eating, praying, Rejoicing together, praising God together. I, I know we can't do this every weekend, and dear me, I think it will be the end of me, but, <laughs> but it's great just spending time with each other, isn't it? Yeah. See, we've got a problem in society today, and it's this rise of individualism. 
And it's something that capitalism and consumerism have fed into. Where our whole identity as an individual is more important than our identity as a whole. And what that does is it fractures genuine Christian fellowship. See, a body is not a collection of individual parts. A body is when those parts come together and join together and become one instead of lots. An integral part of the fellowship of the early church was that they shared meals together with gladness and sincerity, praising God. And this wasn't the after church, after, uh, uh, faith supper. Although that's not a bad starting point. It was the informal, unplanned getting together of believers. It was turning up at each other's house. Let's hang out. Because the trouble is, is you can try and organize this stuff. With the life groups, we're trying to do that a little bit. You know, you get together with different groups. Try and organize this stuff all you want, but if people aren't into it, it doesn't happen. Whereas if we're really into it, it doesn't need to be organized. We just turn up. We give someone a phone call and say, hey, TGI Fridays are doing endless appetizers next week. Fancy that. I picked that as an example because uh, we went there with Emma and Greg a few weeks ago. <laughs> Dear me, you feel ill afterwards. But... <laughs> But, you know, just hanging out. Turning up with people. Don't turn up without asking. You know, that's rude. But just hanging out with each other. Spending time with each other. We're family. Wouldn't there be something wonderful to reclaim? The unplanned getting togethers. The not organized stuff. Fancy coming over for a meal. See, the early church understood this. They were family. They're not a club. You're not an organization. It's not a, a workplace. It's a family. Guys, you're, you're my family. They spend time with each other. They enjoyed each other's company. They loved each other. There wasn't anybody just flying solo. The Western church today parcels people into age groups. Or different stages of life groups. The young couples go over there. But if they have kids, they don't go over there. They go over there. The elderly folks don't go near those or young people. They go over there. The married elderly folks not, don't mix with those ones. They go over there. That is not the picture painted in this passage. It is the entire body. Young, old, married Single, loving one another, learning from one another, interacting with one another. That's why there's so many commands given in the New Testament regarding how we bridge those age groups, like such as the older women teach the younger women, that the younger men be in subjection to the elders. It's about community. It's about this age groups together. And we as people, we tend not to want to not do that. We want to stick with our peer groups. That's why the Bible, I think, specifically tells us to mix. There's meant to be an interaction, a learning, not a divide. Now, that's not to say there's never a time or a place to break up into certain groups. It can be helpful. But it's to say that we need to keep an emphasis on understanding the value of family, of generational being together of the benefit of learning from different people in different stages of life. I hate the idea of youth church in the sense that it's an entirely separate thing from church because where's the, inter where's the family? Where's the generations? I love that we're a generational church, that there's people of every age group. I love that. Youth groups and elderly groups are an effective way to reach out. Yeah? They're a good way to reach out to people. We have a great youth group that's doing great work reaching out. We have a great kids group that's doing great work in reaching out. But they're still part of the body. 
We don't see them as separate. We have Oasis that reaches out not just to the elderly, but people who have spare time during the day. But it's not separate. It's part of everything else. Bear in mind, of course, youth groups. Uh, up until Youth for Christ started its movement in the 1940s, youth groups didn't really exist. And in the 1970s was when youth pastors first started to become a thing and getting hired. And all of this is tied into, in some way, the commercial consumerist invention of the teenager. Teenagers didn't really used to exist as a separate age category, as a separate demographic. The foundations for youth work was really laid in the birth of Sunday schools um, in the 1900s. But of course, Sunday school in the 1900s wasn't an alternative to church. It was a way of educating kids who wouldn't otherwise have been educated. And then it was another 40 years after that, that youth ministry started to become a thing. But it was always meant to be, like Youth for Christ, was meant to be an extra way to reach out, not a cause of segregation. And remember, for nearly 2,000 years of the church, it didn't exist. Please understand where I'm coming from here. I'm not saying we shouldn't have these things, but what these things should never do is cause an us and them in church. There should never be in any church an us and them. It's just us. We are one body. If we start to see ourselves as separate packaged little groups, then we've misunderstood what church community is really all about. And that applies to the way we're growing as a church. As a church, we're beginning to plan congregations. Stockton has had two now of its morning meetings. It's two, isn't it? Um, in New Year, they're going to be every week apart from once a month. Um, Seat and crew will see the same thing happen eventually. But this should never be the cause of us and them because it's us. See, it's easy to have fellowship with people when Christ is at the center. And not the fact that you happen to go to the same building on a Sunday morning. If we were all family in the Lord, fighting the same fight, serving the same risen Lord, then that is our common bond, not that we just happen to be part of the same church. It doesn't happen. True community it does not happen in those 30 seconds you say hello to somebody after the meeting. True fellowship is built upon sincerity of heart, sincerity of motive, gladness, and the fact that exaltation of God is at the center of your relationship. You know, the world can get together for hours. They can do small talk for hours. There's country clubs, restaurants, sports bars, all that exist to facilitate that kind of thing. And what separates the church from the camaraderie of the world is the centerpiece of our conversation is the Lord. Genuine love between believers deals with sin issues. It's more concerned with mission and holiness than it is about small talk and being nice. I liked what Alan was shared about that guy who used to come around and he, he could point things out. Because love, love does that. That also needs to be done in a loving way, of course, otherwise it's, it doesn't work. See, just because a few Christians get together doesn't actually mean some edifying fellowship has taken place. In fact, sometimes it can mean the opposite happened. Fellowship, in its fullest sense, goes beyond just discussing the news because community fundamentally is about God and not us. When the body of Christ gathers together, don't forget your head. Good advice. When you're hanging out with the church, don't forget your head. Number three, the early church devoted themselves to praying together. Prayer as a church was likely informal, spontaneous, and formal on regular occasions. Since the fellowship was God-centered, they may very well have called out to him as they fellowship together. We need God to be more central in our conversation. 
in our relationships, in our interactions. And when we do that, we stop praying together more. Community doesn't just happen because a group of people have made the same profession to serve God. True community happens when we love each other enough to pray for each other. You know, one of the most caring things we can ever do for each other is to pray for each other. It's a beautiful thing. It's a wonderful thing. We need to lift each other up more to the Lord. Number four. The first Christians were described in that passage as having a sense of awe. In Acts, it seems today that there was a re- excitement to assemble. Even on the days beside Sunday, they were excited to assemble together. Their lives were consumed with scripture, praying, studying, and fellowship. Yet they still managed to do their jobs. They still managed to attend to their families. And Christ was in every area of their lives. There was none of this selfish... Car- oh, this is a word I can't say. Carpartment. I heard it. I still can't say it. That's it. Carpartmentalize. Is that right? Right. No? You know what I mean. There was none of that. No, here's the thing, no program, church program, no background music playing when you come in the room, no other artificial means can generate awe. Picking a peppy song to begin worship with, to get people into it, isn't a bad thing, but it's not going to create awe. Again, understand, I'm not saying we shouldn't have these things, but you can't replace awe with something material. Atmosphere is not the same as awe. I'm not against atmosphere, but it can't replace awe. It's the work of the Spirit reviving his people to live sanctified lives and then filling them so that their worship is just out of the abundance of that. That's where awe comes from. Having zeal and preaching the word is a start, but it is insufficient unless the spirit moves. You can have the most gifted speaker in the world, but if the spirit doesn't move, nothing. No light show, no visual presentation, no brand named coffee, no talented musician or charismatic speaker can hold a candle to the move of the Holy Spirit. Perhaps the most significant thing we do as churches, which keeps this awe-inspiring encounter aware, is we first and foremost don't make our services about God. We don't approach in fear and trembling. See, there's something about how we worship that maybe it's just too casual when you consider we're in the presence of almighty, holy, wonderful God. See, if we come together with a small view of God, we will have a small experience of God. But if you come in here with a massive, awe-inspiring view of God, let me tell you, you will have a massive, awe-inspiring encounter with God. Awe is not something we just feel. It's a trembling in our spirits before the wonder and majesty of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Awe is that feeling you get when you stood on the edge of a cliff. Not half a mile away from the cliff. It's a joy that overwhelms us because God is God. He is all powerful. He loves us. He died for us. And it's all about Him. We will be utterly taken up in wonder and glory. And it has nothing to do with us. Nothing to do with what we can do for God. Or what we can conjure up musically. Or what we can speak eloquently. It's not about what we can humanly conjure up. But how awesome and amazing our God is. See we can take our focus off God in so many ways. Even in church. It can happen when... Where you're leading and nobody's responding and you think right 
Come on, everyone, sing louder. It happens when we make the congregation an audience instead of a body. It happens when we overemphasize the experience of worship and how, oh, it's lovely feeling worshipful. Instead of concentrating on the words of truth in the songs that testify to the power, majesty, and awe of God. Chris is gone, but I'm going to pick on him anyway. Chris came to me before the meeting started. We were singing Rain Down. And he asked to change some of the words. Uh, Instead of singing, my heart is dry, and still I'm singing, it says, my heart's on fire. That's why I'm singing. And here's the point. He realized the words are as important as the tune. What you're singing is as important as how you feel when you sing it. Yes? And unfortunately, in a lot of modern worship songs, ain't much in the words, but they feel good. But actually, what Chris did there was really good because he realized day three of of the revived gathering, we're not dry. So he injected something new into that, some truth in that. So when we're singing it, it's reflecting how we're worshiping. I think that's great. And sadly, so many contemporary songs don't draw our attention to God because they're not about him, they're about us. Rather than telling God we want to worship him, maybe we should worship him. I want to pick on a song Alan picked on last night. Come, now is the time to worship. I don't like that song. Maybe for What was the reason the guy didn't like it? Oh, yes, yeah. I don't mind that bit. But I just think when I'm singing that, come, now is the time to worship. Well, come on, get on with it. (laughs) There's some nice songs about God that aren't worship songs. That if they come on in the car, I'll enjoy singing to them. But they're not worship, they just feel good. We need to reclaim theology in the songs. We need to reclaim how telling God he is good. He is good. Oh. Yeah? Not. I'm trying to. I'll not pick on any songs just in case it happens to be songs people like. But there's too many songs with the word I in and not enough songs with the word you in. During the Lord's Supper, if we don't regularly explain what it's for. And take time to remember Christ's suffering and sacrificial death. Then our minds will wander from the awesome encounter with God communion is meant to be. And I know when we take communion, we pretty much read the same verses every time. But that's okay. Because the idea is we need to focus in what it's about. Communion is an important time. It's a time that we remember, and it's important we take space to do that. How a preacher approaches the Word of God will affect our ability to see how awesome God is. If a preacher just casually references a verse here and there, and then talks about things that are hardly related, or just repeats a phrase time and time again, we're likely to fail encountering God because we've journeyed outside His Word. I'll not get too much into that because we did that the other day. But, you know, if all we're doing is sharing nice stories, you might as well as go to the theater. We must approach God in awe and reverence and fear. And we need to be very careful that we don't put much more emphasis on what the preacher says and how he says it than on what the word of God says and how God says it. When we put anything of the focus on ourselves, we steal God's glory. And God won't be having any of that. Number five, the early Christians possessed an unusual generosity. Those who had an excess of wealth sold the excess and gave it to those who had lack. This wasn't some kind of version of socialism where the church government set people's wages and standard of living. It wasn't like that. 
It was a cheerful giving to ensure everybody had what they needed within the church and without. It was just this cheerful, bless you. It says they gave to all as there was need. Unfortunately today many live in excess and mourn about giving to God. I don't believe it would be a stretch to say that when compared to the early church, today's church is far less generous. And this inevitably leads to less unity, less love, less fellowship, and less community. I can say this because they're not here. Paul and Sharma went out with us. Um, I'm naming all the brand restaurants today to KFC the other week. <laughs> and uh, Paul and Sharma, I, I would say financially don't have as much as us, but they paid. Before, before we had, it was a, such a blessing. Such a blessing. See, that's community. That's love. While some today we lack, while, while people are lacking, we're holding back. It's always been God's plan that God's people are those who supply the need for God's work. I'm going to say that again because it's fast. It has always been God's plan that God's people will supply the need for God's work. Always. So often we think, <laughs> I've, I've heard this one a lot. <laughs> if the church or this ministry needs money, then God will bring it about. And saying that completely gets us off the hook. If God's in it, someone will pay for it. If God was truly in this, then the finances would come. True. Maybe from you. See, God takes care of his work, but he does it through his people. Yes, the finances will come in, but it's meant to come in from God's people, not the clouds. Here's a verse we very often take the wrong way. Malachi 3.10 Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And thereby put to me the, to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open up the window of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. Now, according to this verse, why do we tithe? Not for the blessing. The blessing is promised in the same verse, but the blessing is the consequence not the reason. It says, bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. That's why we do it. So that there may be food in God's house. Not for the blessing. The blessing is what happens as a result. The blessing should never be the reason that we give. We give to support the work of God. So when we give, we focus on the work of God. If we focus on the blessing, rather than the purpose of giving, we completely get it upside down. And unfortunately, we focus on the blessing, and men in ministries focus on the blessing, because that's what gets people to give. And it's wrong. The early Christians were of one mind. Paul exhorted the Philippians in Philippians 2.2 2, saying, Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. You see, true community requires that we have, have the same mind toward one another. Romans 12.6 says, Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty. Is that right? Haughty? But associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Wow, there's a verse the church could do with hearing. Never be wise in your own sight. See, being of the same mind requires we don't live according to a mindset that ranks people one above the other. We're not to think of ourselves as better than somebody else because of who we are, because of what we do, or because of what we have. Let me tell you, there is no partiality with God, so we can't afford to have partiality in our church. Because if we have partiality, we don't have fellowship and unity. Number six, and finally, 
And most excitingly, the early church received a blessing of conversions. We learn that the Lord added daily to their number those who were being saved. Can you just imagine that? Celebrating somebody being saved every day? And it wasn't that the church was cloistered away in some room, tucked away and away from the world and reality, and God miraculously brought people through the doors. It wasn't that they just got and prayed and prayed for people to be saved. No. It's they got out there. Listen to this quote from Leonard Ravenhill. I don't know if it's possible to put that on behind me. It's quite near the bottom. It doesn't matter if you can't. Could a mariner sit idle if he heard the drowning cry? Could a doctor sit in comfort and let his patients die? Could a fireman sit idle and let men burn and give no hand? Can you sit at ease in Zion with the world around you damned? Some Christians believe that if they're just faithful, then God will add to our number. It doesn't happen. We must be faithful. But part of that faithfulness is that we share our faith. And we engage in evangelism. The early church was known for its kindness, but it was also known for sharing the gospel at every opportunity. Hardly a conversation would go by without the gospel coming up. It was central to their lives. It was central to their identity. And it show, they showcased it for everyone who was watching. We are responsible to witness. Now God might not add to our number in that incredible way he did in the days of the early church. But the idea is there should be somehow, sometime, and adding to taking place. If a church is revived, effective evangelism can and should follow. That community pictured in Acts is not something that happened once and then will never happen again. Sure, times are different now. The apostles are no longer with us. But true fellowship and community like they experienced can happen again. Oftentimes church is not a beautiful thing or a beautiful place. But Christ wants to beautify his bride. The church of Jesus Christ. The work of revival is to make the church glow in beauty and in splendor. And that doesn't start with other people. It starts with us. Individually. Dealing with where we lack. You know, I think there's no question that the church today is spiritually sick. But we can't gloat in our sickness as if it's a sign of being humble. We need to actively look for healing and restoration. The church in Acts 2 was not described as sick in any way. Two of the churches in Revelation passed God's examination for church health and purity. A healthy church is expected and possible. It is in no way acceptable before God who has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness for us to conclude that there's nothing that can be done to help the church heal and grow. A complacency and subpar attitude of faithlessness must be abandoned in church if revival is to come. We can't just say, hey, we're imperfect, let's deal with it. We must desire to become a beautiful bride. Pentecost meant pain. Yet we have so much pleasure. Pentecost meant burden. Yet we love ease. Pentecost meant prison. Yet many of us would do anything rather than for Christ's sake go to prison. 
perhaps Pentecost relived would put many of us in jail. Imagine, just for a moment, Pentecost next Sunday. That for a moment I'd be endued as Peter was. And under my word, brother Ananias is slain. And then his wife, dead beside him. Can you picture that? What would happen? What would the church say? The charity commission would close us down. <laughs> or Paul smelt an any mass with blindness. He'd be in court. Now, I'm not suggesting we should see people die in church. Do not get me wrong. But I'm saying, some of the stuff that went on in the book of Acts, I tell you, the world would not want to see. Scripture presents the possibility of the bride of Christ being beautiful, not sick and not decrepit. And to tolerate less than that is an utter lack of faith. Faithlessness is a blasphemy of the intention. It's a blasphemy of the intention, character, and power of God. And we need to be healed of that. We need to be forgiven. Our testimony must be restored. Increase and fruit must be born in our church because God doesn't tolerate hypocrisy. And if we're hypocrites, we've got to repent rather than just go, huh, I'm a hypocrite. Otherwise, how will the world recognize us? How will they see Christ? How will they know that God sent his son? If God can't change our lives by the power of Christ, why would they believe God can change theirs? If the church is sick, we need to be part of its healing. And if we don't repent, I tell you, we can expect God removes lampstands from churches. That's why there needs to be revival. That's why we need to change. This nation is in a desperate state. But before the Methodist revival, it was in a desperate state too. We've not gone so far that we can't get back. Israel spent more years in disobedience than this nation has so far. And they came back. This nation can come back from where it is today, but we need to believe that. We need to believe things can improve. We need to believe things aren't going to keep on getting worse and worse. And it can only happen when a revived biblical church gets functioning. It can only happen when the church gets healthy that this nation has any hope of coming back to God. May God heal his church and beautify his bride. Revive us, Lord. According to your loving kindness and according to your word. Revive me, Lord. Andrew Reed, a minister and hymn writer, once wrote these words Come as the fire and purge our hearts with sacrificial flame. Let our whole soul and offering be to our Redeemer's name. Revival is not God doing the work he's given to you. Revival is not a shortcut around the Great Commission. Revival is the church coming alive. Revival is the church humbling itself, praying, seeking God's face and turning from our wicked ways. Those aren't avenues to revival. Those are revival. Because a revived church gets on mission, gets on the job that God has given, preaching the gospel, impacting the world, and then people get saved in their droves. Revival is the church getting back on mission. I was at some, um, I'm at the air court, I'm sorry, revival meetings in South Africa. And the word revival, like I said a few days ago, was applied very early on in that. And I had a conversation with someone and, and, and asked, is this revival? And their reply was, no. This is what church should be like. <laughs> See, that's what revival really brings. Church, as it's meant to be. Does that mean revival will come in the way we often picture it? Maybe. 
Maybe not. That's God's call. But regardless of that, we can be a revived people. In the Hebridean revival, the church got praying. The gospel got preached. Then people were saved. Didn't happen in isolation to that. In the Welsh revival, the church got back to praying and preaching the gospel. And as a result, people were saved. The Methodist revival, the church was in a state. And then a group of men, including the Wesleys and Whitfield, were set on fire. And they got praying, they got worshipping, and they got preaching the gospel. It's time to wake up. Starting with us. It's got to start with us, but it can't be just us. It's time the church stopped waiting for revival and instead started a revolution. Let me tell you, as I said the other day, individualism is so prevalent now. Nobody else is, willing, is able to sustain a, a revolution at the moment. They all start and they all peter out. If we really got our focus on God, we could start a revolution that doesn't. There's a problem, I believe, in the modern church today. You see, revival happens when the church gets set on fire and people come to watch you burn. But the problem with the church today is we enjoy getting lit. You know when you light a match? Paul will be very glad to hear I didn't bring matches to do an example of this. When you light a match, what happens? You get that initial spark, you get that burst of flame, and many Christians are hooked on that feeling of the hooked on that feeling of getting lit and they go around looking for it and they treat the fire of God like a rush of emotion where we go from event to event looking for that feeling where we can go oh, fall down get excited get up that was great I need that again we go a meeting after meeting that rush of excitement infilling the spirit boom that's not revival. You don't light a match for the initial spark. And if all you do is light a match, it burns out and you've got to light another one. You light a match to start a fire. From the day of Pentecost, there has not been one spiritual awakening in any land that has not begun in a union of prayer and evangelism. Even in that prayer started with two or three. And no move of God in history has continued after the prayer stopped. Let's not be a church that enjoys getting lit but a church that enjoys burning brightly. Samuel Chadwick said this, the sign of Christianity is not a cross, but a tongue of fire. We're gonna pray. Can the worship team come up?